Last week when we were continuing our study, we came to the phrase, catch the foxes, and we recognized that even in the most secure relationship, it is important for us to, to pay attention to the foxes, the, 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 the roaring lion, the, the serpent, the enemy who wants to bring things our way that cause us to lose focus of the most important thing in a relationship, which is the relationship. That our relationships share a whole lot of different areas that can bring joy and stress and, and, and attention and time. But to remember the relationship, to guard it, to protect it, and to see what's at the heart of it. Scripture sells us a product. What is that product? A relationship. You can have a relationship with the living God and with each other. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Love one another as yourself. Scripture is all about relationship. But if there was a tagline, it would say, it's more about the heart than the hair, right? Like, it, it is, right? That, that, that's, that's at the heart of it. However, Song of Solomon is going to remind us of something. Don't misunderstand when I say that. Scripture does celebrate the hair. Scripture does celebrate that. And so let's begin with that. And so I'm going to begin with this little phrase. Beauty is in the eye of Solomon the beholder. Beauty, when he's writing this truly, beauty is in the eye of Solomon the beholder. When we read chapter 6 and verse 4, what does he say? You are as Beautiful as Tirzah, my darling, as lovely as Jerusalem, as awesome as an army with banners. Turn your eyes away from me, for they have confused me. I, just, I, I you know, when you look at me, I just, oh, right? I can't think. Your hair is like a flock of goats that have descended from Gilead. Your teeth are like a flock of you. you I never had to say that word. Anyhow, which have come up from their washing. <laughs> All of which bear twins, and not one among them has lost her young. But your temples, whew, well, they're like a slice of a pomegranate behind your veil. What does he say in verse 10? Who is this that grows like the dawn, as beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun, as awesome as an army with banners? We touched on these verses way back in the beginning. We began this and we started, right, talking about where we were going. Then we set up the groups, you know, the, 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 how much attention is given to the beloved, and, you know, him and her and then the chorus. And we launched into, if you see it, say it. Look for ways to affirm. We touched on them then. But boy, does he just shout it out here. I remember the very first time. I saw Lori Partridge, right? Some of you are like, who is Lori Partridge? But if you were a boy in the 70s, right? Late, yeah, but when did it start? 70s, 71? I remember noticing her on the TV screen, right? My sister Kathy, it was Keith. It was Keith. And she thought he loved her. I think I love you. He was singing to Kathy. And she went to the David Cassidy concerts. Where are you, Kathy? If you're out there. Anyhow, but, 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 but for me, Lori. And I have to be honest, it wasn't her harmony. <laughs> and it wasn't her keyboard playing. It was the way she looked at me. And her eyes, right? <laughs> and even that cute smile when she got her braces. Yes, she started hearing a radio station over her braces, and that was a tough episode. But, but, but the way <laughs> that she would look at me, right? Solomon says, that, what's ha that happens to us. The good news is, it isn't the exact same look for everybody, but it happens to us. Catches our eye, right? And Solomon sings. He sings a song. You are beautiful. For some of you, it's Frankie Valley. My eyes adored you. Or it's Joe Cocker. You are so beautiful. Or it's, it was a James Blunt, right? You're beautiful. You're beautiful. It's true. For Solomon, he has his words that he sings out. In verse 10, when he says, Who is this that grows like the dawn, as beautiful as the full moon, as pure as the sun? I have no idea if that 
inspired Roberta Flack, but I remember her singing, right? First time ever I saw your face. I thought the sun rose in your eyes. Right, you can just hear she said, her voice. Rose in your eyes and the moon and the stars were the gifts you gave to the dark and endless skies. All the different words he used. I remember first seeing Greta in the hallway at PCB. Whoa, who is that? I remember looking at and thinking, wow, she's, she's beautiful. And if I were to write a song, I would have said, her eyes are like two Panzerottis glistening. <laughs> In the hot oil of a deep fryer or whatever, you know, whatever, <laughs> you know, to, to, to get on his, his, his terms, right? See, God has, it's, God has designed us to be attracted, right? I, I thought that would make you feel great because you know what that means to me, right? <laughs> With extra cheese. Okay. <laughs> God has designed us to be attracted, right? To be attracted to physical beauty. And you don't have to be attracted to the same physical beauty that I'm attracted to. That's what's wonderful, right? We, you know, beauty is in the eyes of Solomon, the beholder, at this moment. And at one place, he says, it wouldn't matter how many women there were. You're the one that's the most beautiful that he's talking about, Right? This song is in Scripture. There is nothing unspiritual spiritual about telling someone that you find them attractive. You say, I, I think your eyes are beautiful. That's not, I, I, you know, physical beauty doesn't last. No, this, you can tell somebody their eyes are pretty and be bringing glory to God. In chapter 7, we're not going to get into it, but Solomon reaches for every physical thing he can think of. Imagine this. Imagine you're sitting down with Solomon, and we're going to play Pictionary, and it's Solomon's turn. And Solomon draws some jewels, and he draws a goblet, and he draws a bundle of wheat, and he draws some lilies, and then he draws a young deer, a gazelle, towers of ivory, Pools of water, a mountain, purple threads, a palm tree, grapes on the vine, and apples. Now, obviously to take that time, but he drew all that. And we're supposed to guess that the answer is a woman that he loves. But that's, in chapter 7, he uses all of those physical things to say how beautiful she is to him. It's a physical emphasis. And the point I want to start off with is this. If you are going to a formal this week, hey, dress up and enjoy it, right? If you're going to, you know, to, with, with your school or whatever, if you're, you know, got, enjoy getting your hair done and makeup or getting, I don't know if the term spiffed up means what it meant to me back, you know, getting all spiffed up and ready, you know, buy that, that, that nice dress, right? Absolutely enjoy making yourself feel beautiful and handsome. Go ahead. If you are, you know, whatever it may be, if you're working out right now because in another month or so, you want to be walking the beach, right, without the shirt, and you want that clearly defined abs, you know, one of the things that helps is just use a marker, a little marker. <laughs> <laughs> but you want those clearly, now, listen, there, there you, it is okay to celebrate and rejoice in the physical beauty that God has created mankind to be beautiful. It is not glorifying to God to say, wow, Lord, the heavens are amazing. Wow, look at those flowers. Wow, look at the mountains. But me, I'm just, oh, oh, I'm just, oh, don't look at me. I'm hideous. No, you've been created in the image of God. There is a beauty to you. And so that's wonderful. Enjoy and celebrate your exterior features, but remember what Solomon knows. 
that your physical is not final. That how the mirror sees you today is not how the mirror is going to see you in 30 years, 60 years. And so it moves to a second statement. And stay with me. That beauty is in the eye of Solomon the beholder, but when we read the same person writing in Ecclesiastes, from him, his perspective, beauty is passing by Solomon the older, right? Beauty is in the eye of Solomon the beholder, but when we get to Ecclesiastes chapter 12, it's before Song of Solomon, we're going to see that beauty is passing by Solomon the older from what he can see. Now, in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, Solomon tells us something. You can turn to chapter 12, but in chapter 3 he says, there's a time to be born and there's a time to die. And in that phrase, you might be like, whew, can you just, can you let us enjoy the growing up, the, you know, this. Uh, he just says, there's a time to be born, there's a time to die. Know this, that birth leads to growth and growing beauty and growing abilities, which then begin to decline and they begin to, you know, and, and eventually he says what? There's a time to be born and there's a time to die. Physical abilities, physical uh, aspects to us will decline. In chapter 12 of Ecclesiastes, he describes that more, right? He says in, in the end of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, Remember also your Creator in the days of your youth, before the evil days come and the years draw near when you will say, I have no delight in them. Before the sun and the light, the moon and the stars are darkened and clouds return after the rain. And he's talking just about like this this. Well, a de declining time in his perspective, right? Verse 3, in the day that the watchmen of the house tremble, and most would agree, commentators of the watchmen, he's talking about the arms and the hands, and, and they begin to, to tremble some, and the mighty men stoop, and he's talking about as our legs start to weaken a bit, and the grinding ones stand idle because they are few, and he's talking about our teeth and how we begin to, to lose them some, and, and those who look through the windows grow dim, our eyes start to not see what we could see. Verse 4, and the doors on the street are shut as the sound of the grinding mill is low. We, we can't quite hear what we used to be able to hear. Now, I want to make something clear. Solomon is not saying older people are not beautiful. He's not saying that, and neither am I. What Solomon is saying is they don't look the way they looked when they were younger, right? right? I don't look the way I looked when I was 21. I don't. And, and the honesty of the mirror is that, hey, you look in the mirror and you say, I like my hair today. Great, go ahead. Take a, get that camera up there. Take a picture in the mirror. You like your, your hair today. That's terrific. But the honesty of the mirror is, your hair may not look like that later today, right? <laughs> or, or, or let alone 40, 50, 60, whatever amount of years from now. Solomon is reminding us that, that the physical will falter. And it may happen before you anticipate it. In Ecclesiastes chapter 9, this is the same Solomon. That over here in Song of Solomon is saying, Whew, oh man, you're beautiful. Oh, I can't think of enough things to say about your beauty. Over here he's saying, but I've learned enough to know that it's not going to stay looking exactly like that. And it may not be because of years, it may be because of life. What does it say in, in chapter 9 and verse 11, 
Ecclesiastes 9.11, I again saw under the sun that the race is not to the swift and the battle is not to the warriors. And neither is bread to the wise, nor wealth to the discerning, nor favor to men of ability. For time and chance overtake them all. Moreover, man does not know his time. Like fish caught in a treacherous net and birds trapped in a snare, to the sons of men are ensnared at, so the sons of men are ensnared at an evil time when suddenly it falls on them. In Song of Solomon, chapter 1, when she is speaking in the beginning, this uh, gal who Solomon says is absolutely beautiful to him, what does she say in so Song of Solomon, chapter 1, and verse 6? Do not stare at me because I am swarthy, for the sun has burned me. My mother's sons were angry with me. They made me caretaker of the vineyards, and I have not taken care of my own vineyard. What's she simply saying? My brothers made me do some heavy, difficult work that some other girls were not doing, and it beat up my skin. Life can do that. Life, it, it, it might not just be years. It may be uh, the difficult aspects of life. Something you don't anticipate. You know, it, it, I think we began this series talking about like biblical belly buttons, right? Because like, I, I pulled that verse out of Song of Solomon chapter 7 and verse 2 where it's talking about, you know, the, the, the navel being this goblet, you know, and, and um, mine has a gigantic scar from two abdominal surgeries that go past it, right? You know, but my point I'm making is like life made a big change uh, carving, uh, you know, uh, on my abdomen at a certain point time in life. Life may hit you in different ways. We just were out uh, at Grove City with my daughter Natalie, and somehow we drove through rain for all the way across the entire state of Pennsylvania yesterday. Like you would think somewhere there'd be, anyhow, we, we were out at Grove City, and one of her roommates, her father, just was last week, whatever, week, two weeks before their graduation, was in a motorcycle accident. And Praise the Lord, he survived, and he does not have any brain damage that they're aware of, but he basically broke every bone in his face, his forehead, his cheekbones, his jaw. So you, you, you talk about a change in physical reality. The point is that beauty is in the eye of Solomon the beholder, but beauty is also passing by Solomon the older, and those two things bring about a few truths that you may already be thinking by the grace of God. And the first one is this, don't let yourself be defined by the physical. Don't let yourself, who you are, be defined by the physical, right? What, what did God say. He, he made that clear when he was looking for a king. In the Old Testament, 1 Samuel chapter 16, right? 1 Samuel chapter 16, you may remember it. Even Samuel himself realizes he kind of fell into the, you know, the trap of, oh, I, I know what a king would look like, right? For in 1 Samuel chapter 16, is God is telling Samuel to go appoint a new king because he is rejecting Saul because of his sin. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, um, Samuel goes to um, the home of Jesse. In verse 6 we read, Then it came about when they entered that he looked at Eliab and thought, Surely the Lord's anointed is before him. Oh, this has got to be the guy. <laughs> you can just look at this guy and know. Most likely to succeed. He's got it all over him, you know. You know, he, 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 this guy, he's probably one like best looking, best hair. This is the one. He's the one. But we read in verse 7, the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature because I have rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. I, I particularly have a heart sometimes for you young ladies out there, you young gals. This is a tough media world we live in that 
hammers you. I, I had conversations with my daughters about that. Hammers you with the thought that if you don't look like those women advertising those products, that you are inferior to them. And that is ridiculous, right? First off, it's ridiculous, humanly speaking, because there are other cultures in this world who would march their people forward and they look very different than the people in there. There are other cultures, there are other times where what is considered the ideal is far different than this generation and this time. Don't let the media tell you you have to be this size or you have to look like that or else you are inferior. Your beauty and your value is not determined by whether you look like that model on TV. Same thing for guys too though. Listen, your beauty, your value is not determined of what, do you look like that guy when he's got that tight under armor on and he's, you know, you know that, 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 if, if you're like, I'm never going to put that on because I don't look like he would look like, don't let that determine your value. If you're a senior, your beauty and your value is not diminished because you can't run as fast or you can't see as far or because of any other physical feature. Right? What does God say? God looks at the heart. The God of all creation has chosen to love you. That's where our self-image has to begin. There's no secret. Anybody who comes into me, into me and struggling, I'm struggling with, I don't know, that's how I feel about myself. I say, well, what do you base how you feel about yourself on? Well, you know, some people are really, you know, they're really good singers and this and that. And they list a bunch of things. I said, none of those things are things to base. Here's the one thing I base my value on. The God of all creation chose to love me. The God of all... Does it mean a lot to me to be, have people care for you? It should, it should, I, I'm still misunderstanding. It. I, it, it, it means those, those human you know, affirmations and connections are so meaningful. But this is where, strip all the rest away, this is where you build your sense of value. That the God of all creation chose to love me. He considers me a precious pearl. He considers me a field that was worth sacrificing the life of his son to go purchase, right? He considers us, whew, that's who I am, right? Don't let yourself be defined by the physical. The beauty of your heart. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Whew, they're beautiful. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Jesus says, that's be whew, beautiful. The fruit of the spirit is love, joy, peace, kindness, patience. That's beautiful. Bruce Newman, the body God gave him on this earth, was a polished physical ability body. Here's what I mean by that. Bruce knew martial arts. I used to joke with Bruce. I used to say to him, you know, I'm going to come at you, and you just, don't hurt me, but take me down with one move, and then teach me, teach me that move, or whatever, right? But Bruce, Bruce, you wouldn't know it. Mr. Just up here with it. But, but Bruce was polished in martial arts skills. Bruce could play any instrument, physical, bass guitar, like drums, right? Bruce was a polished swimmer. Bruce, you may be aware of this, he swam with the sharks at the Camden Aquarium once a week. They would have him go in there and swim around with the sharks. Bruce was... He, even down to his fingers, right? He, he could do magic tricks and stuff, and you'd be like, literally, how, how did you? What did, he just had tremendous physical abilities. And then I was sitting with him in the fountains when 
he was sitting in a chair. And I said to him, Bruce, were you able to get in that chair? And he said, no, they had to put me in the chair. I said, are you able to stand up out of the chair? He said, no, I can't stand up out of the chair. I said, Bruce, can you, can, can you move? I, I have to use my left arm to move my right arm. And I said to him, Bruce, you are a man who has experienced such tremendous physical abilities. And they're gone. There's no reason pretending they're not when you're sitting there talking to the person. They know the reality, right? I said, they're gone. But Bruce, you are as valuable to God and to all of us in this moment as you ever have been, right? Your value is who you are sitting there. Your value is the person that we have come to love and to care for. And God still has a purpose for you even in this diminished physical ability. And he looked at me and said, you're absolutely right. I absolutely, you're absolutely right. And I praise God for it. Don't let yourself be defined by the physical. There's a second thing, and I need to hurry along because we have communion. Prioritize inner beauty in yourself and in others. Listen, tell them, your hair looks beautiful. That's great. That's not diminishing inner beauty. That's, you, you give glory to God. Hey, you look beautiful. Hey, I love your eyes. Hey, this, you're beautiful. Hey, whatever. That's, that's fine. Man, you know, whatever you want to compliment about somebody, give praise to God for the beauty of the exterior that he has created, the physical body. But what does Paul say to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4? And this verse may have already come to your mind as we were talking. 1 Timothy chapter 4, for there Paul says this, but for bodily discipline is only of little profit. But godliness is profitable for all things, since it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. Bodily discipline, it has profit. You you discipline your body. Some of you can run a lot further than I can, you know, because you you have disciplined your body to run a lot further than I can. There's profit to that. If we're needing to get away, you're going to get away, and I'm not, right? (laughs) You can run further than I can, right? But what does he say? Godliness. Prioritize inner beauty in yourself and in others. What does he say in Peter? Peter says to us, the Holy Spirit does through Peter in 1 Peter chapter 3. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 3. He doesn't say, thou shalt not wear jewelry. No. He says this, your adornment must not be merely external, braiding the hair and wearing gold jewelry or putting on dresses, but let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit, right? The heart, the heart, the heart, physical, celebrate it, discipline it, do what you want to, to, to enjoy it, and, but remember Prioritize inner beauty in yourself and in others. When I was dating Greta, early in our dating time, um, came, I don't know if it came up in conversation or just, you know, we were sitting around and she liked Butch Cassidy and Sundance Kid. And I know why. Because of Robert Redford. <laughs> and she didn't hide that. Ooh. Robert Redford. But you know what? I never felt like I needed to go home and bleach blonde my hair or whatever, right? I wasn't going to look like Robert Redford. It just wasn't going to happen. And I share it for this reason. I never felt like I needed to. She never made me feel like I was the shortest guy in the room even though I usually was. She she made me feel like, 
I want to be focused on the, those qualities inside even more because I, that, that's, that's what she celebrated in me. It makes a difference. You step into that circle, circle of guys who are ranking girls. Well, you know, let's, 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 who are the top ten look, good-looking girls in our, in our class? Over there? Circle of girls doing the same thing with guys. Who do you think are the top ten looking? Whatever. And it's all physical, physical, physical. And you step in and you just say in that circle, you know what, though? That fella, he is the kindest guy. He looks out and just, you, you, you could bring about a change. <laughs> Yeah, he really is, or she really, to, to, when you prioritize inner beauty, it impacts, it really does, it impacts the dynamics in the circle. There's a third thing that I want to conclude with, and it's this, remember Jesus, remember Jesus. Beauty is in the eye of Solomon the beholder, and beauty is passing by Solomon the older. Don't let yourself be defined by the physical. Prioritize inner beauty and yourself and others. And remember Jesus. What does he look like? The Bible doesn't tell us much. It tells us he was five foot six and had dark curly hair. Um, no, it, it doesn't, it, that's not really in there at all. It tells us the color of his eyes. Compassion. So they were either compassionate brown or compassionate blue or compassionate hazel, whatever. What were the color of his eyes? All we know is we're told they looked at people with compassion. What was, how tall was he? What was the color of his hair? Where do they tell us what he looked like? John tells us in John chapter 1. He talks about that eternal Son of God, the Word was with God, and then he says, He became flesh, and He dwelt among us. Oh, what did He look like? I want to tell you what He looked like. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw Him. We saw His glory, the glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. That's what He looked like. What did he look like? Here's what matters, what he looked like. He was full of grace and truth. That's what he looked like. He was full of grace and truth. It doesn't matter to me. You know, I, I, know, that, I know that Jesus didn't have my skin color. I know that. I know that. It, but it doesn't matter to me what his skin color was. It doesn't matter how tall he was. It doesn't matter what his voice sounded like. It matters to me that he looked like grace and truth. What matters to me is the heart that we saw from him. The beauty of Jesus was in his heart. And he said, I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. I did not come to be served, but to serve and to give my life a ransom for many. I will lay my life down for you. His heart, his heart is beautiful. And that's what we're going to celebrate. This week I was talking to another fellow in town. We were talking about the 5 and 10. We missed the 5 and 10. I missed the 5 and 10. As an adult, sometimes I would go in there just because it smelled the same as it did for the last 40 years. So, you know, that, that 5 and 10 at least, you know. And so I'd walk in and, and I'd head to the back to the toys. I'm not sure who was buying their underwear in the 5 and 10. I would go to the back, you know, to the toy section. There were plenty of things being sold in there that I was like, oh, yeah. but back I went. I have so many memories as a kid in that toy section. With the, we, I'm talking to this guy. I'm talking about army men and the water pistols and, the, you know, all the, th the little matchbox cars, everything we got back there. And I said, wiffle balls. He went, oh, wiffle balls. Wiffle balls and wiffle ball bats. And how many we got in there. And, and I, I'm jumping here because it, it made me immediately think of a memory that I shared with others, but, but my mind went to, to Bob D'Alessandro. Bob and I... <laughs> Bob and I have been friends for 40 years. And one of my memories was we had planned a, a, a wiffle ball game in our backyard. 
Now, where are the tars at? Your backyard. It's your backyard now. They, they, they live in the house that I grew up in. Uh, and we, we line the field. We, 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 you know, I was in my indestructible early 20s. And we played wiffle ball that day. And a wiffle ball, two outs or whatever, game on the line, a ball got hit into kind of left center, and I'm going after it. My dad had lined underneath our back deck. He had enclosed it with fiberglass panels. I caught that ball at full sprint. I shattered that fiberglass panel, and I ended up, you know, on the ground there. But, you know, we won the game. And um, you know what? The beauty of that body is long gone. I, I'm not going to crash my 56-year-old body into a fiberglass panel. I'm just not going to do it. But the beauty of my friendship with Bob remains today, even though physically we are not what we were 40 years ago. We had lunch one day, and we were sitting there talking, and as Bob was talking, Bob talked about how overwhelmed he is 40 years later that God would love him, that Jesus would take his sins upon him. And as Bob talked about that, he teared up. And I thought to myself, it doesn't matter what the mirror sees when it looks at me. The mirror can't see what I was seeing in Bob at that moment. The beauty that I saw in him, that our friendship is anchored on, and it'll never fade away. Never fade away. Honest mirror on the wall. You just can't see the best of all. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for the true beauty of the heart of God that somehow, stunningly, you put in us. We ask you to let us be what we prioritize the greatest. We celebrate these bodies that you've given us. We do. We rejoice in the beauty of them. We will continue to praise you at the way that we see beauty in each other. But Lord, help us to see far beyond the mirror. Help us to prioritize what goes much deeper. The beauty of the heart. May we see the, the beauty of Jesus there. As we prepare for this communion now, we pray. Amen.